thank you all for coming. I know it's a difficult morning after the party. <laughs> and everybody leaving Boston. Unfortunately, we wish you stayed here for longer. I live here in Boston. I teach at Tufts University. So I'm very happy to see uh, some old friends and make new ones. But uh, I'm supposed to talk about the book. Uh, and since I wrote it, and I have been doing research on the subject of the book after the first uh, Spanish version in 2016, I have many things to say. I'll try to summarize them so you can have an idea, uh, since I assume you haven't read the book yet, of what this book is about uh, and why I think it's a modest contribution to the field of Latin American studies. Uh, the book departs from my interest uh, from many years ago on El Inca Garcilaso, the Barrera, no? uh, this uh, great uh, mestizo chronicler to whom I devoted my doctoral dissertation, uh, independent in 93, and uh, I've written three books on El Inca Garcilaso already. However, it's not just an Andean chronicler, he is a pivotal figure to understand Peruvian history, Andean history, Latin American history, and I would say even world history. But El Inca Garcilaso is better understood also if we keep into account the repercussions of his work, uh, not only among uh, Andean caciques and, and the local reception, but also on the other counterpart of Peruvian society, which is the hegemonic uh, part, the Creole. Groups. So I decided to study the reception of Inca Garcilaso on Creole authors from very early after the publication of the Royal Commentaries in 1609, the first part. And the first evidence of the arrival of the book uh, in the Andes was in 1612 in a manuscript by the famous extirpator of idolatry, Francisco de Avila, the same one who compiled the Guarachiri Ma manuscript. And from then I started to look into other authors, you know, Calancha, Buenaventura de Salinas, uh, Rodrigo de Casasola, uh, epic poetry, and I found out that the great uh, Creole savant of Peru, the equivalent to Sigüenza y Gongor in Mexico, in Peru is Pedro de Peralta y Barnuevo. He read the Vinca Garcilaso very meticulously, and he used the second part of the Royal Commentaries to elaborate his great epic poem, Lima Fundada, published 1732. So I had to cover from early 17th century to mid 18th century a series of authors who had uh, talked about the reception of uh, the royal commentaries by Inca Garcilaso. And then I found out that uh, these uh, readings of Inca Garcilaso were usually accompanied by other um, subjects of debate among Creoles themselves, but particularly between Creoles and Peninsulars. So I started to elaborate um, an interpretation of the role of Creole groups during at least 150 years of literary and discursive production, the role of the Creoles in the uh, elaboration of a concept that I developed in this book, uh, which I call the ethnic Creole nation. You know, a very polemic term because now we use the term, uh, the word nation in a modern sense. No? It's the modern sense that has been very well explained by authors like Eric Hoffman and uh, Benedict Anderson. But the word nation itself is not new. It, it comes from Latin, as you know, natio, and it's a version of ethnos, which means exactly the same. No? A group with internal homogenic characteristics that include religion, uh, language, ancestry, social uh, forms of uh, relationships. And uh, I found that the Creoles in Peru, the descendants of the conquistadors mainly, what are called the Benemeritos, no? it's a, an aristocracy of Creoles, that they invent their own tradition and they present themselves together as a group that is kind of a middle uh, actor in the uh, process of colonization of the Andes, uh, in which the Spanish peninsulars are on one extreme, the dominating extremes, and the indigenous subjects and African subjects on the other one. Uh, 
So creoles are kind of in the middle, they have to mediate between these two important groups and they have to defend their own rights and their own privileges vis-a-vis -vis both uh, big groups. So the book is divided in, in, in six chapters, uh, mainly on uh, uh, authors like Pedro de Oña and his uh, view of the uh, Mapuche world through the poem Arauco do Mal, published 1596. Then I talk in the second chapter about what I call the collective narcissism of Creoles with their exaltation of the Peruvian and the Andean world with its uh, huge mines and rivers and mountains. Then the third chapter has to do with the um, relationship between Creoles and warfare, uh, how Creoles participated in wars, particularly uh, the defense of the Viceroyalty of Peru against these uh, the English and Dutch uh, corsairs, which they call thieves, uh, pirates. Then uh, a poem in ch chapter four of, uh, by Fernando de Valverde, uh, uh, an Augustinian friar who published a beautiful and, and a very uh, difficult poem called Santuario de Nuestra Señora de Copacabana en el Perú. It's about the Virgin of Copacabana, um, a figure that was worshiping, still worshiping the Lake uh, Titicaca. Uh, chapter 5 is about a Baroque poem called Fundación y Grandezas de Lima. Uh, it's an exaltation of, of the city of the kings, which was for over 200 years the capital of South America. Uh, and then the poem is written in a very peculiar language. It's a mixture of Latin and Spanish, so it's not easy to read. And then the last chapter is about uh, Pedro de Peralta's Lima Fundada, which explains the title in Spanish, the original title in Spanish is of the, this book is Lima Fundida, which is a play of words, no? uh, uh, screwed up Lima, that's what it literally means. No? Uh, Lima cannot be understood, Creoles cannot be understood without acknowledging the importance of indigenous and African groups and also of peninsula elites. Uh, so it's in many ways a history of Peru, a history of the Andes, but focusing on the specific role of, of the Creole elites their literary discourse production during uh, over 200 years, I would say. So that's a summary of what the book is. I don't want to elaborate too much because we don't have a lot of time and I, I would be more interested in knowing your, your questions and, and your comments, uh, not only on the book, but uh, maybe on the subject of Creolism in general or uh, the confirmation of an Andean uh, literary uh, tradition. So the floor is open, if you are interested in intervening, or I can talk more if you want, but <laughs> you're going to get four, uh, maybe Wayne first and then no. Christian, or, or Christian first. <laughs> yeah, my question is, uh, what is the difference between the Spanish version and the English version? Very well. Yeah, this is an expanded version. Um, I re-elaborated chapter two, uh, which is the chapter about uh, what I call uh, Creole collective narcissism, uh, I offer more documentation, and I also included uh, 21 illustrations in the English version which are not present in the Spanish version. Uh, so my preference goes to the English version, but I know that in Latin America uh, the book is not going to be that accessible. But if you're in the U.S. and you read English, um, I recommend that the English version first. <laughs> but there are some differences, yeah, it's not exactly the same book. Mine is kind of a pop culture link to this. Since the movie Sama mm. came out, people have been talking about this, the stuckness of the Creole class, mm. the Criollos in Latin America, and that sort of not being able to get ahead because of the Spaniards. And I, Is this part of your book? It's part of the argument, yes, definitely. And it was a very real problem for many Creoles. <coughs> Uh, this is something that I explain in the book, but I, I can uh, summarize it. Uh, the word, the word uh, criollo in Spanish comes from the Portuguese criollo. That was the term applied to the children of slaves, African slaves, mm -hmm. born outside Africa. So it was a, a, <coughs> a word that wasn't very prestigious mm -hmm. at all. It was a derogative uh, term uh, used for 
children of African slaves. So when the conquistadors arrived in the Americas, uh, and first they have mestizo children and indigenous women, but then the Spanish legisla legislation uh, encouraged the Spaniards to marry Spanish women. And that's how the first Creoles were born, no? children of Europeans born outside Europe or specifically outside Spain. This was also a derogative term uh, for good reasons from the peninsula point of view, because many of those children uh, that were included in the legislation of the Republica de Españoles, uh, and this is something that has been very well studied by Sue Schwartz and Elizabeth Kuznetsov, the two historians, many of those children were still mestizos. You know, their parents recognized them, they were children of indigenous mothers, but they were included in the category of criollos uh, by their, their parents. So when the new laws of 1542 were decreed, the, the laws that transformed the colonial world, uh, because they limited the power and the tenure of land uh, by the conquistadors, the children of those uh, Spanish conquistadors felt that that was a direct attack against their interests. And they uh, turned the, the word Creole, which was derogative, and assumed it in the 1560s when they were already grown ups in the 1570s, and decided to call themselves Creoles uh, to oppose their identity to the peninsula. They will still consider themselves, they would still consider themselves as Spaniards, but in the sense as, in the same sense as Andalusians or Catalans or other regional groups in Spain would call themselves uh, in order to uh, differentiate themselves of the Castilian uh, political and economic uh, power uh, represented by the Conor. So uh, going back to Sama, the 18th century, this dispute definitely continued and even uh, grew visibly, uh, the, the, the opposition between Creoles and, and Peninsulars, particularly because Creoles were subject to uh, a lot of scrutiny, uh, their loyalty was questioned in many ways. Some of them did well, very few Creoles uh, accessed uh, important positions in the Spanish administration, but just to give you a sample, for example, in 1608, the time of uh, Pedro de Oña, uh, the, the first author that I study uh, of the, uh, around uh, 48 uh, corregimientos, no? which was the institutional form of succession of the encomienda, only six were Creoles. Mm -hmm. And if you revise the history of the 40 viceroys of Peru during the colonial period, none of them was mm -hmm. Creole. So that, that reveals that the Creoles were always underestimated and underprivileged, according to their own view. And they said, well, our parents, grandparents, and great grandparents were the ones who won these lands for the crown, and we received nothing mm -hmm. in change. So, uh, yeah, the, um, the novel no, by Benedetto and the, and the, and the film by uh, Lucrecia Martel, which is actually a very good film, mm -hmm. uh, it's representative of this dispute in many ways. I would say both. There are one, 21 illustrations in the book. Um, maybe I can show you one. Some of them are, uh, for example, very informative. This map of the Peruvian vice royalty around 1650, uh, of course, give us a, an idea of the uh, dimensions of, of South, uh, the Peruvian vice royalty in South America and how Lima was the administrative center that dominated the entire, or almost the entire South American territory, with the exception of the Brazilian or Portuguese <coughs> uh, territory, and the general Capitania of Venezuela. But all the rest was called Peru. So this is on chapter two, where I talk about the transformation of the term Peru, uh, which wasn't exactly what we understand today as Peru, which is the, the modern country with very specific uh, territorial borders, uh, uh, the concept of Peru in the 16th and 17th century was, was much bigger. First, uh, it was considered like the natural succession of the empire of the Incas, uh, that's for example the concept that Inca Garcilaso uh, 
uses in 1609 in the royal commentaries and all. Uh, but then during the 17th century and 18th century, Peru meant practically the entire South American subcontinent. Uh, and then there are even pictures. Uh, let me see if it's yeah, here. This is the frontis of the poem, one of the poems that I analyze, uh, Santuario de Nuestra Señora de Copacabana by Fernando Valverde, in which the Virgin of Copacabana, Copacabana is standing over the globe in the entire Western Hemisphere is South America with the name Peru. So it's, it's a concept that uh, uh, mutates during this uh, last 500 years, but uh, was the concept that Creoles in the 17th and 18th century used to, uh, not only to praise their land, but also to uh, self-praise uh, uh, themselves uh, towards the Spanish, because they said, well, we are born in the richest land, in the most beautiful land in the world, so we're better than anybody else. <laughs> and, and that's a concept of uh, what I call collective narcissism that in many ways has prevailed yes. in the Republican period, in the 19th and 20th century, which explains very well why problems like discrimination, racism, and, and others uh, are still uh, uh, everyday experiences. In But yeah, I use the pictures in, in, in both ways to illustrate the argument, but also to bring new arguments to the book. And yeah, there was another uh, question. Just something quick. Um, do you, are you focusing mainly on the criollos in Lima, or are you? Good question. Yes. Um, and then the second part of it was, why stop in the seventeen the seventeen thirties? How much more do you see this extending up to? The period or a little before? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, two questions that definitely um, help me to explain a little bit more about the nature of the book. Um, I mainly focus on Limeño Creoles because they are probably the most important group at that moment. No? But I acknowledge that there were other groups of Creoles, like in Cusco, Arequipa, Trujillo, or other cities of the Peruvian vice royalty. Santiago, Santa Fe de Bogota. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, to cover all those groups would be uh, probably a project that would entail uh, a few other books that uh, maybe someday I will try to, to write. For the moment, this is a first step. And then the other question about the time frame. I stopped in the 1730s uh, in respect to text that I analyzed. No? The last one is uh, Lima Fundada, but Pedro Peralta, as I said, published in 1732. But the epilogue is a reflection, the epilogue of the book is a reflection on how there's a continuity in the, the paradigms that Creoles elaborated during the 17th and part of the 18th century that had uh, prevailed in their behavior towards other social groups. So uh, the book uh, includes even quotes by Alan Garcia in the 20th century about how he refers to indigenous groups of citizens of the second class. And I explain that kind of uh, political uh, position uh, with a historical background. So it's a book that is kind of ambitious, but I don't analyze in <coughs> depth texts from the 19th century or the 20th century because uh, it would be too much to, to embark on. But it's suggested, and it's basically a proposal <coughs> on how many current problems in Peru or Latin America come with the conformation of a Creole uh, agency that, of course, has changed during 400 years or 500 years, but that are still uh, alive and kicking. <laughs> uh, we can see, for example, the position by someone like Bolsonaro towards indigenous people or Vargas Llosa when he says that Indians have to adapt <coughs> to modernity and leave behind their, uh, their, their tradition, their language. That's a very Creole disposition that you can find in the late 16th century already. It's nothing new. Enrique. There are other uh, research about Creoles as well, other books that yeah. came out in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. the last five years probably. How do you book, discuss with those books? How, how do you find those arguments? 
yeah, even before the last two years, uh, the classical words uh, on creolism, uh, for example, in Peru, are from Bernard Lavallee, no? who is the great initiator of this kind of study. Uh, but in Mexico, we have uh, Solange Alberro, Jackie Lafay, and many others that already work in the 1980s and 1990s uh, on the concept of creolness, uh, not only as a product of the discourse and behavior of the children of conquistadors, but of some conquistadors themselves who creolized themselves when they found to be what they called señores de la tierra, no? lords of the land. They become like very important and very rich members of, of the colonial society and they wanted to defend their interests against the crown. So that's a creole sentiment as uh, Alberro called it, and also José Durán uh, talks about this. In more recent years, there have been other uh, contributions, of course, uh, for example, Poetica de lo Criollo, no, by Daniel Solokov, <coughs> and Juan uh, Dulli. Uh, in Mexico, there have been a few other works that deal with uh, Sigüenza y Góngora, and Sor Juana, but I don't go too much into those books because they're not part of the subject of my, of my project. Uh, uh, regarding Peru, there is a wonderful initiative uh, by uh, Studios Indianos, the group Studios Indianos, uh, in, in Spain, uh, in Vapor del Archivo, from the University Universidad Complutense. Uh, Sarisa Carneiro, who is here, she is also contributing with uh, editions, for example, by uh, her wonderful recent edition on the Terremoto de Lima in 1609 by Pedro de Oña, who is an author that I study here, but I don't study that specific text by, by Oña, but most important and longer poem, Araujo Romao. So there are recent contributions that I uh, acknowledge. I hope I, I do a, a good job there. And maybe a few of them that I couldn't notice in the last year or two are not present. But I think that most of the recent bibliography has been taken into account in the book. All right, well, so I just have to recommend the book. <laughs> uh, it's very